Jeremiah 25, if you would there, I'm going to read verses 8 through 11, and then we're going to jump over to Ezekiel chapter 11, where we'll spend our time this evening. Kind of be back and forth a little bit tonight between Ezekiel and Jeremiah uh, with this uh, third part of the glory is gone, and this will be the last section uh, of that where the uh, glory of God departs from Jerusalem and the sanctuary. But notice Jeremiah 25 and verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, <clears throat> and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them, make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy Years. You may be seated. The verses here in Jeremiah reveal to us the truth that God is going to bring his judgment. Throughout Jeremiah's prophecies, he continues to reveal the fact to us that the civil as well as the religious leaders and rulers of Jerusalem were not willing to not only know the will of God, but were not willing to do the will of God. They were promoting idolatry, and they were not interested in calling the people to repentance, or calling them to prayer, just as we did this evening in Lord Heal Our Land. And I pray it's not just a song that we sing, but it's a prayer that we pray. The Lord here, as we've been looking at this section of the glory is gone in 8 through 11, or 7 through 11, um, the Lord has presented the evidence he has announced the verdict, and he has declared the sentence. Last week, we saw that there would be a remnant that would be spared. We also saw that the rebels were going to be judged, and the glory of God was revealed to Ezekiel once again in the imagery that God allowed him to see. What we will see here this evening is no different than what's happening in our day today. We have a lot of Christians today who do not care to know what God's will is for their lives and then do it. It's no different than it was here. There's no desire for the most part to repent of our sins and to seek the guidance of God, to seek His pardon, and to seek His mercy. My prayer for tonight is that we will learn from what we see in this chapter. So notice, if you would, first of all, the first 13 verses. Now this chapter 11 is here, the, if you're doing any type of titles throughout the chapters we've been looking at, this is where we see the leaders deceived. The leaders are deceived. Verses 1 through 13, we see the city is likened unto a cauldron. It's likened unto a cauldron. First 13 verses. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Yehazanah and the son of Azer, uh, or the son of Azer, and Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, 
princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city, which say it is not near. Let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak. Thus saith the Lord. Thus have you said, O house of Israel. For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Ye have multiplied your slain in this city. Ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, your slain, whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. But I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. Ye have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, saith the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and will execute judgments among you. Ye shall fall by the sword. I will judge you in the border of Israel." And ye shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof. But I will judge you in the border of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. For ye have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. And it came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Here Ezekiel, as he is brought now to the eastern gate. Remember, we left last week where the glory of God moved from the sanctuary uh, and, and over above the cherubims over to the eastern gate where the cherubims had also now moved. And so the throne of God and the glory of God is over the eastern gate now. And so God has uh, Ezekiel uh, lifted up from where he was at, where he was viewing what was taking place, and taken also over to the eastern gate. It's here that he sees those 25 men, which we said are likely priests, because they are between the altar uh, and the wall. And so uh, here they are worshiping the sun that we looked at in chapter 8, verses 15 through 18. And so here they are worshiping the Son, and, and again they are brought before us. These individuals are now named influential men of Jerusalem. Yeazania and Palatia. I learned something this week in trying to pronounce these names, that the I-A-H is Yah. That isn't how we would pronounce it. But I wanted to do it somewhat justice anyway. And so these two men are named. It tells us that uh, these two are giving wicked advice. Advice that was not from the Lord. Remember, here are 25, two of the 25 priests that are supposed to be giving the word of the Lord. But they're not giving the word. And, and, and when you think about what they are doing and what they are worshiping, how could they give anything from the Lord since they are worshipers of the Son? In fact, the Bible lets us know that these were plotting evil so that they could personally benefit from the Babylonian attack. They were opportunist. They were seeking to help themselves instead of their country behind the mask of patriotism. Now, we don't have to stretch our imagination too far. We have some today that are saying, oh, this is what is best for our country while they personally profit from the times of crisis. We've seen it this week in the riots. Opportunist, not caring about the individual that lost his life, not caring that the officer that did that has been arrested, not caring for truth or justice, just opportunist, 
to go in and steal and rob and cause damage. Opportunist. And that's what these two were. Opportunist. Hiding behind another truth. Notice, if you would, the false counsel that's giving in verse 3, which say, it is not near. Let us build houses. This city, Jerusalem, this city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. Here is this false confidence to these within Jerusalem that are in a very dangerous situation. Let's build houses here. The city is the pot. We are the flesh. We're safe. This is our place. Let's get involved in it. Notice, if you would, back in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah gave a completely different message. Remember, Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. He's in Judah. And here's his message in Jeremiah 29 and verse number 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dream. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord that after seventy years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good towards you, my good word towards you, in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. A lot of times that verse is pulled out and made to stand on its own in regards to personal direction in life, but when you see it in the context of what is taking place and and what God is saying to those uh, in Jerusalem that were going to be captives, that they were to not listen to the false prophets, they were to listen to what Jeremiah was saying, they were to listen to the message that God had to go, when you're taken captive, build your homes in the land of Babylon. Plant your fields in the land of Babylon. Make sure you have children and that your children have children. That's the place because you're going to be there 70 years. And I don't want you to be diminished. I don't want you to die off. That's what the Lord was saying here. That was the message. You you build houses, you raise families in Babylon. In fact, you pray for the peace of that place because you're going to be there 70 years. Now, God was going to save a remnant, but the idolaters would be slain. Ezekiel was to prophesy against uh, these evil leaders, and and he was to make sure that that they weren't uh, uh, in... (laughs) Uh, They were not in the midst of the cauldron. They were not the meat uh, in the pot. In fact, they were the butchers that had killed the innocent and stolen their possessions. It It brings to us the slain there in the midst of the city that God reveals to us here. And these would soon know that the Lord alone is truly Lord of heaven 
and of earth. And judgment was going to come to Jerusalem. Look, look if you would, in Jeremiah 39. 39, verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, <clears throat> and they besieged it. Now notice this. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. It was besieged in the ninth year, the tenth month. It was broken through in the eleventh year of the fourth month. Verse 3, And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even uh, Nergal Sherazar, Sam Garnebo, I wish they had Jims and Bobs, <laughs> Sarsakim, Rabsaris, Nelikasherizur, Rabmag, and with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them, and all the men of war, when they were fled and went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him... They brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon." That's what was going to take place. That's what did take place. And in Ezekiel was seeing how this was going to happen. Now notice again, if you would, verse number 13 of Ezekiel 11. It came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, died. Then fell I down upon my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Ah, Lord God, Wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Here as Ezekiel is delivering this message, uh, Palatia falls down dead. The Lord was giving proof that these sun worshipers had their evil plans and they had their evil thoughts and they were going to lead to destruction if the people continued to follow their prophecies and their message. Ezekiel also here, interesting as we see Ezekiel's response to this, that Ezekiel still has that shepherd's heart. Remember, he'd been called to be a watchman. He'd been called to care for the people. And he, and he reveals the shepherd's heart here as he falls on his face and, and he prays, God, would you still keep a remnant? Is there going to be someone that is going to remain? And as I thought about this, I thought, you know, that's a good lesson to learn for us. You know, if we're not careful, and I'll do a little bit of confessing, watching all the stuff that's been taking place in Minneapolis, all the destruction and, and the burning and the looting and all of that, you know, one of my first thoughts was, Get, get a megaphone, get a helicopter over, announce, you have 30 minutes to exit these four blocks, and then we're dropping. Anybody who wants to stay, you'll be destroyed. You know? Just because of what they were doing and the destruction of other people's property. I know in Nevada... In Vegas, the building that Brother William has up there with his company was defaced. No reason, just because. We saw it here in our own city last night. Those that just want to destroy and make gain for themselves. 
But Ezekiel sees this taking place. And God had to rebuke me for it. I, I, I said I was sorry. But you know that flesh sometimes just like to come out. You just like to be in charge just for a moment. And it's a good thing we're not in charge at that particular moment. But here God is revealing through Ezekiel as, as he sees what's going on. And, and he sees Palatia die before him. And he bows on his face and cries out to God. Is anyone going to be spared, God? Is judgment going to fall on all of them? You know, and there shouldn't be any rejoicing over the judgment of God. There's not going to be any rejoicing if we get to view what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. When folks stand before the Lord and try to give an answer. Well, you know, I did the best I could. Well, I lived my life the way I, I, I thought was best. Well, God, I, I believed in you. I just didn't receive Christ as my Savior. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And be cast in everlasting hell and darkness and burning. We're not going to be rejoicing over that. There's not going to be shouting any praise for that. Here Ezekiel is imploring God and, and he's not rejoicing over the judgment that, that God has announced and what's taken place here. Our response should be to pray to God that he would work in our hearts and, and, and bring about that, that turning from sin to righteousness. Found a verse, Proverbs 24, 17. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth. And let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Oh, that should be our heart. Hey, listen. Apart from the mercy of God, we deserve everything bad. We don't deserve anything good. And we shouldn't rejoice over anybody else that goes through difficulties and struggles and judgment of God. It's a good verse to go back to. Notice, if you would, God reveals a remnant as Ezekiel prays here. God gives him an answer. Verse 14 through 21. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel holy are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord? Unto us is this land given in possession? Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Here's God's word of encouragement to Ezekiel. God will spare some. God will spare some. Again, verse 16. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Now the self-confident Jews in Jerusalem thought they were safe. They thought they were secure as long as they had the temple. 
As long as the temple's here, this is where we're going to be. It's our safety. It's our security. But the Lord said he would be their temple wherever they would be taken. Their little sanctuary. Psalm 90 verse 1 says, which is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, as it starts off. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. You see, Moses was before the temple. He was instructed to build the tabernacle that was temporary, that could be picked up, moved, taken, set up in another place. But Moses, the man of God, said, Lord, you've been our sanctuary in all generations. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 6, 19 is the personal promise to us. What? Know you not? That your body is the temple of God? We are indwelt by the Spirit of God. We have His presence in us. And that's the personal promise. The corporate promise is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. That's the corporate promise of God's presence in us, that ye are the temple of God. We have His presence as it's before you there. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's corporate. That's us as a body of believers. 619 is the personal indwelling of the Spirit of God in us. We have the promise that's given. We, we, we are to be abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be experiencing His presence with us. We are to have uh, the confidence that God is with us wherever we are at. And that was God's promise to the remnant. I'll be a little sanctuary to you. Your trust isn't to be in the temple. It's to be in me. And the presence of the Lord said, I'll be there, just as he does with us. Now notice again what he says in verse 17. He says, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people. One day. One day, a remnant would return to the land. One day, that remnant would rebuild the temple. This promise goes beyond the time of captivity. Because it is in the end times that he will gather his people together. Notice, if you would, chapter 28 here of Ezekiel. Chapter 28, verse 25. Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely therein and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. You can also reference chapter 34, reference chapter 36, chapter 37. You can reference Isaiah chapter 11. You can also reference Jeremiah chapter 24. It deals with this time of restoration. This time of restoration. And this is what is being dealt with here. Because we also see in verse 17, I will give you the land of Israel. I will give you the land of Israel. Now the land has already been promised to Abraham and to his descendants. Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 brings to us that promise. Chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, brings us that promise. Chapter 15, verse 7, brings us that promise. 
that God was laying out to Abraham and to his seed. And so, literally, no one can lay claim to it successfully. It's Israel's. When the exiles would return after the 70 years, they would be cured from their idolatry and they would remove the pagan worship. In verses 19 through 21, we have a spiritual renewal that is yet future. Not 70 years future, but still yet future. The accounts that we have in Ezra, as a portion had gone back, allowed to go back to Jerusalem, as we have the accounts in Nehemiah, where he was burdened for the walls that he heard were broken down, and, and he went back and began to build up those walls, and we know in 40 days it was accomplished. In the times of Haggai and Malachi, we know there was no spiritual renewal nationally. Nothing nationally took place. But one day, when, when Israel is going to be regathered into her land, they will repent of their sins. They will trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, just as Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14 prophesy to us. Whew, what a time that's going to be for them. That time of renewal, that time of, uh, of restoration, that time of welcoming Jesus Christ as their King. That's what's going to take place then. In Ezekiel 33 through chapter 48, God reveals what is prepared for them. And we'll see that as we get to it. But as a child of God, we get to share in this new covenant. A covenant that is not written in stone, but a covenant that is engraved in our heart and in our mind. As 2 Corinthians 3 and Hebrews 9 and 10 reveal to us. What a blessing is ours. A blessing that God bestows upon us. Now, I bring us back to Ezekiel 11, and we see the glory departing. And I'm going to open up a little bit of my study time, because as I was studying for this and preparing this, my heart ached for this scene. And so as we read it, realize what is taking place at this time that Ezekiel is getting to witness. Verse 22, Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards, the Spirit <clears throat> took uh, me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord hath showed me. Here to realize that the glory of God was departing from this chosen city of David and the future place of the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel could have written Ichabod, over Jerusalem at that time, just as it was said in Samuel's time, when the ark was taken in a time of battle, and Eli's sons were killed, and, 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 and Eli fell backwards and, and died as, as, as uh, the, the child was being born. Here, Ichabod could have been written. Now, we know the glory of God appeared at the time of Christ's birth. John 1.14, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten, the Son, full of grace. God brings to us that truth, the glory of God at the time of Christ's birth. We know 
According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, that they crucified the Lord of glory. But he arose. And he ascended back to the Father. One of these days, and remember that time after the resurrection, and before he fully ascended, had that time to uh, instruct his uh, uh, believers and his followers that were the core of that first church, that it was there on the Mount of Olives. It was there on that eastern slope where the glory is departed here. There in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, when those disciples saw Jesus ascending back, and lost sight of them in the clouds. We know that according to Zechariah chapter 14, Jesus is going to come back. And He's going to establish His kingdom. And He's going to stand on that Mount of Olives. And we know that Ezekiel was privileged to see the time when the Lord reveals that coming kingdom. Look last, if you would, chapter 43. Give you a hint towards the end. Chapter 43, verse 1. <clears throat> Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, remember chapter 11, glory of God departed. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with His glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chibar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up, brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. The vision of the glory of God departing as far as through chapter 7, through chapter 11, is now complete. Ezekiel is now brought back to his house. And he now begins to tell those that were assembled there all that he had seen and heard. I thought about this. I wonder, did some believe? Did some believe? Or did they continue to believe the soothing words of the false prophets? Four years after the message that Ezekiel was given, Ezekiel would get the message, the siege has begun. What we read of Nebuchadnezzar coming up in the ninth year of Zedekiah. It would be three more years before Ezekiel would get word Jerusalem had fallen. God's word never fails. The question is, do we believe it? Or do we pass it off as unimportant? How do our lives reflect what we're doing with God's Word? Is it that important to us? My prayer is, and my fear is, that we would never see the glory departing from our own individual lives, and from our church. That never would we have Ichabod. The glory has departed. That should be our prayer. Lord, we want your glory here. I don't want it to ever lose or be left from me. I don't ever want to see it gone from our church. 
But then let's also always be looking forward to his kingdom. Let's be looking forward to the time that he's going to rule and reign here on earth. That's going to be a blessed time to see the glory of God coming back through that eastern gate and coming into that temple. You know, that's why the Muslims have built a graveyard in front of the eastern gate of Jerusalem. Because they don't believe that any holy prophet would ever go through a graveyard. <laughs> it ain't stopping Jesus. They've even walled up the eastern gate. He's going to go right through it. Listen, our Savior's coming again. And we need to look forward to that time. But let's believe his word. Let's believe his book. And let's live our lives according to it. Every head bowed if you would. Every eye closed. Where are you at in your Christian life? In your belief of the word of God, how does it affect you? Does it make a difference or do you just go on as it doesn't really matter? Let God have his way. Remember I said at the beginning, I pray that we'd learn from the message tonight.